Hey Ivy Environmental students, we are starting topic four, which is all about biodiversity and conservation. Let's get started. Make sure you have those new topic four objectives. If you don't, make sure you check back Blackboard. All right, so before we get started too deep, we need to make sure we all are agreeing about what diversity is defined as. And it's a generic term for heterogeneity, which is meaning differences. Um, there's a lot of different types of diversity that we're going to define on the next slide. One for species, one for habitats, and one for genes. But what we really are thinking about in this class, when we look out into the environment, how many differences do we see? And why do we care about those differences? And why is it good? So before we get going, we have to understand really what a species is as well. A species is referring to an a group of organisms that can interbreed and that can produce fertile viable offspring. For instance, the butterfly and the bird are, the bald eagle specifically, are not the same species. They can't interbreed. They also have super different characteristics. But even though the bald eagle and the Mississippi crane are very similar in the sense that they're birds, they have wings, they have beaks, they have those clawed feet, they are not the same species. They cannot interbreed, even though they have a lot of physical similarities. So let's talk about the different types of biodiversity now that we understand what a species is. So um, biodiversity in general, like I said, is the differences, the amount of biological or living diversity or differences per unit area. This is the umbrella concept term. All the other things are going to fall under biodiversity. They're just more specific. For instance, genetic diversity is the range of the genetic material present in the gene pool or the populations of the species. For those in IB biology, think about the fact that there's going to be different genes and sometimes those genes could be used to make medicine. This is really important or maybe those genes help the organism survive. Species diversity is the variety in the amount and types of species per unit area. We know that this is about richness and abundance and we've even calculated it using Simpson's diversity index. Lastly, this is something that's kind of new to us, but you guys were noting it when you were talking about your jar ecosystems, that in the natural world, there's a lot of habitat diversity, and this is actually a good thing. Per a range of different area, how many different habitats or types of niches or niches are available? So are there different places for the organism to live? Are there different types of biomes? This is a good thing, and we want to conserve the habitats because that's where the organisms live. We also try to conserve serve the genetics and even the species. So these are all important definitions, so make sure you jot them down. Why do I care? We're jumping to a later objective. Um, we care because overall these species and their diversity function together like puzzle pieces to make the earth or the biosphere work together. Think about inputs and outputs, they're all interconnected. And that diversity makes the whole biosphere a stable system, a stable equilibrium system, and I spelled equilibrium wrong so you can laugh at me. But either way, we want that stability because it's nature's insurance policy. If I push this green ball, it's going to kind of move back and forth, steady state equilibrium, negative feedback loop. This is a good thing, but if I push this red ball, whoa, it's going to totally go to a new equilibrium position. That's not good for an ecosystem or a biome. So this is our source of all of our natural capital. That diversity provides us for many more goods and services. It also is how the organisms with that diversity are going to have a lot of those nutrient cycles and some of those goods and services like purifying that we know wetlands do. And lastly, all this diversity took a really long time to occur, millions and millions of years to be the way that it is. So when it disappears, it's going to take a long time to show back up again if it does. So take a moment now to pause and think about this red question. There's not every single place on the planet is a very biodiverse place. There's 19 most biodiverse countries in the world. I want you to think about are these LEDCs or MEDCs and what are the implications to that? And what are the implications that this is very um, not spread out across the whole globe? Is this hard for making policies, which we'll later talk about when we try to think about how to conserve things? All right, how does the diversity show up in the first place? This is going to be all about natural selection, survival of the fittest. Fittest meaning how successful these organisms are at reproducing, surviving and reproducing. The pro process works as follows in the following steps. First, the individuals are different. For instance, the fur color of these mice are variable. There's a different gene that makes the mouse 
darker versus lighter colored. Then the populations produce a large amount of offspring, many mice. And then for some reason, there's different survival rates. Maybe the different environments, the dark environment versus the light environment, will cause different resources to be available or different abilities to avoid predators. Something in the environment is going to cause different survival rates of the organisms. And then the most fit traits depend on that particular environment and will be passed on to the next generation. So in this darker environment, which of the two types of genes, the light fur gene or the dark fur gene, is more likely to survive and pass on its genes? The dark one. So this darker volcanic area for these mice is going to be more full of dark mice. And in this lighter sandy environment, the light ones are going to survive. So this is dependent on the environment. This is straight out of ninth grade biology, so hopefully that's making sense. So let's talk about this over time. Over time, those traits are going to become what we refer to as adaptations. They're making something more successful in a particular environment. And that environment we know is a niche. So what's really a well-known case study is Darwin's finches, which are in the Galapagos. These finches are all in different habitats, and their beaks change their shape over many times because of the environmental pressures of different sorts of food availability and the beak the birds that randomly had the right beaks survived better when they could be able to get the food that was available on the different islands we'll talk about this more in class because certain birds would survive better or worse than others this ends up making those adaptations form totally new species which is called speciation so what do we mean by speciation? There's two major types. The first is geographic isolation. The groups of the, po of the populations of the same species are somehow isolated away from each other. So here's the squirrel population, and this is actually the Grand Canyon. <coughs> Let's talk about some other examples. So this could be maybe that the squirrels finally got brave and migrated across, and eventually they were separated. And the different environmental conditions makes them end up looking slightly different. And not only is, are they slightly different because of this physical barrier, over time, that physical barrier, which could be a, because of a mountain range or an uh, eruption, over time, those different organisms are going to eventually not only be geographically separated because of all these possible reasons, eventually they're going to be reproductively separated or called reproductively isolated. So when they're separated for long periods of time like these bunnies, same thing could have been those squirrels, random genetic mutations and the environmental pressures of the area and natural selection are going to cause the species to diverge enough that their genetics and traits will prohibit their interbreeding or their production of viable offspring. This should look familiar because the ability to interbreed and produce viable offspring is the definition of a species. So these two different guys eventually are no longer the same species because they can't produce offspring. So those two things usually happen in tandem, geographic isolation and reproductive isolation. Some things that could possibly cause these are plate tectonics. Um, plate tectonics, like this animation is showing you, is the movement of those continents, of those plates. This can lead to separation of gene pools, such as those mountain ranges forming, or separating of land masses. Sometimes the connection of different areas can form land bridges and form new species when they meet. But overall, plate tectonics, those movement of those plates here in this animation, they're going to cause that geographic isolation, that formation of new species. Let's learn about a couple case studies really quick before we finish up. So here's some cool case studies. They're pretty fun. So for instance, let's talk about some example habitats that are forming that could form new species. Island chains like Hawaii. As this plate moves, this volcanic eruption is forming new Hawaiian islands. And over time, different organisms are going to form on those islands, migrating from the previous islands, potentially by, by water or by flight. New mountain habitats can form when plates crash into each other. This is India crashing into the Eurasian plate, forming the Himalayan mountains, possibly isolating things and even connecting others. Other things down in the deep sea floor, hydrothermal vents are spewing out sulfuric um, acid and gas, making it so that weird different species are going to be living down there. And lastly, because these plates are moving so drastically, they often move into totally new climatic zones. Um, and when that happens, different organisms are going to have um, 
either survive or over time their adaptations will potentially change. So for instance, we can see Antarctica used to be much connected during Pangaea times with the other continents and that is why we have fossilized evidence of ferns that are oftentimes thought of as being tropical rainforest ferns on Antarctica, which is pretty wild. So those sorts of things are why over time species change. Species are forming that never existed before and sometimes, unfortunately, those changes happen so fast, either climatically or due to humans or natural disasters, that species disappear. So that's our start of biodiversity and conservation. You guys made it. Well done.